Good morning, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I am the Worcester Chambers Program and Events Coordinator. Thank you all so much for being here today. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to the sixth annual Worcesterpreneurs Forum, hosted by the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce and the Massachusetts SBA office. We have a very informative, jam-packed couple hours for you today, full of knowledgeable and engaging panelists, breakout rooms, and a ton of resources and networking for you to take with you after today. We ask that you do please mute yourselves throughout the duration of the event and just double check that you are muted uh, throughout our time together. We do encourage you to have your cameras on and uh, the chat box is gonna be busy today. So please feel free to put your business information and contact information in the chat box. And then during our panel sessions, if any questions come up that you wanna ask individual panelists or general questions, you can put those in the chat box as well. And I will send them to the panel's moderator uh, when we have time at the end. Also, Karen will be downloading a digital program booklet into the chat box. So you definitely wanna make sure that you have this. You're able to download it, save it to your desktop, print it and just have this as an ongoing resource for you. There's a ton of information that is loaded into this booklet. Uh, also contact information, resources. So again, please uh, keep an eye out for that booklet in the chat box from Karen. So we do ask that you stay on and engaged when we are doing our breakout sessions. This is your opportunity to connect with each other, ask really great questions, and again, form those relationships that we're all here to do today. Um, and then should anybody have any questions or wanna stay on a little longer after our 12 o'clock end time, we are opening up the Zoom to stay on for about 10 or 15 minutes and you're welcome to do that if time allows. So with all that being said, it is my pleasure to now introduce Bob Nelson, District, District Director of the SBA Massachusetts District Office. Bob. Well, great. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Stephanie. So, uh, a beautiful uh, spring day out there. It's Friday, so uh, thank you all for joining us for the sixth annual Worcesterpreneurs event. So, uh, wanted to just start to say thank you to Tim Murray and to the Worcester uh, Chamber of Commerce and uh, to the uh, Worcester Business Resource Alliance, uh, but also to Eli Spayu and the SBA team for helping to organize uh, today's event. Uh, I I know that you're going to leave learning new information, but also to be inspired, uh, which are, are the goals uh, of the session today. But I'd like to always start off with positive uh, thoughts. And, uh, you know, there's certainly been some positive trends for small business in the news recently. And so uh, the job growth, uh, growth rate for small business increased significantly in April. Uh, certainly uh, good news. Uh, the NFIB, uh, the Small Business Optimism Index, uh, rose recently uh, to the uh, it returned to the average historical uh, reading since last November. So, uh, you know, we're hearing reports from our small business development center network, the school organization, our Center for Women and Enterprise, that uh, they're seeing a lot of new clients who are interested in uh, starting and launching their business and growing their business. So, uh, you know, it, there's certainly a lot of encouragement with where we are with the uh, re the economy reopening with people getting vaccinated. And, you know, so there's a lot of good news uh, on uh, the small business front, but wanted to quickly uh, go through just some of the things that uh, you've been hearing from the SBA for a long time now, and that's on PPP in our activity. Uh, so, uh, you know, as of, uh, you know, May 2nd, which is the last formal numbers that I received, you know, here in Massachusetts, you know, we're at almost 100,000 approvals, uh, you know, for $6.6 .6 billion. Uh, that's just in Massachusetts. And uh, so there was uh, breaking news yesterday that uh, the PPP funding for regular lenders, it has been exhausted. So uh, no new applications are being accepted uh, for PPP loans, unless they're from a CFI lender. And I, I know we'll get more into that uh, uh, as the discussion goes on, but you know, there's $9 billion of money remaining that CFI lenders can use in order to put uh, uh, any PPP loans through. But you know, our lenders are, are working to uh, 
uh, put loans through that might have hold codes and, and to get those uh, processed. So there's still time for that. But but uh, I guess the, the big message is, is that uh, with the help of our lenders, our community partners, our resource partners, uh, all of us collectively, uh, we helped uh, a lot of small businesses to survive uh, this uh, pandemic and this uh, crisis that we've all been going through. So uh, that is certainly uh, good news. But uh, I quickly just wanted to uh, mention a number, which I, I find just absolutely amazing. And so uh, if you look at SBA's economic injury disaster loans and our PPP loans together, uh, you know, for economic injury loans alone in Massachusetts, uh, you know, we've done $3.766 billion. Uh, and that's just in Massachusetts. But when you compo combine economic injury loans and PPP loans in Massachusetts, it's $25 billion. Uh, you know, this is this is huge. This is definitely historic. And, and, and again, but it's it's only with the help of everyone. The SBA, we're a small agency, but it is only with the help of many, many people uh, who have made this all possible. But the other things that have been in the news lately is the restaurant uh, uh, revitalization fund uh, program, which just launched at noon on Monday. Uh, you know, so what we've heard is that in the first three days, 186,000 applications. Again, this is historic. This is amazing. And so when you think that these restaurants and bars and food trucks, these food service industries, they have been extremely hard hit over the pandemic. And many of them have been closed, you know, whether it's 10 months, 11 months, whatever. But, uh, you know, this grant program uh, is not a loan. This is actual grant dollars uh, in order to help them to revitalize. They are a job uh, uh, powerhouse in the Massachusetts economy and across the United States and you know very happy there is a priority period for women for veterans and for our minority socially and economically disadvantaged businesses and half of the applications that we've received out of that 186 are from those priority groups so it it really is encouraging that the technology worked really really well when you think of that number of applications in a matter of days again this is historic stuff that we're all going through from the SBA and, and stuff that really gets me energized and charged up uh, just because you know we're here to try to help small businesses but the shuttered venue operator grant program again uh, you know really good activity strong numbers over 10,300 applications from live stages movie theaters uh, mu museums zoos aquariums aquariums but again a lot of dollars will be flowing out uh, through the RRF and the SVOG in the coming weeks and which is all good news to further drive our economic growth and our activity uh, here in the Commonwealth uh, and across the country but I, I know we have some amazing speakers uh, uh, and moderators you know uh, resources you're again I think you're all going to leave this event today uh, being inspired encouraged and to learn new information Information. But with that, I'm, I'm going to quickly introduce uh, Tim Murray. Uh, everyone knows Tim. Uh, he is a friend of small business, a friend of the SBA, uh, became president and CEO, CEO of the Worcester Chamber in uh, 2013. Yeah, we all know prior to uh, the chamber, uh, Tim was uh, the lieutenant governor uh, in, for many years and helping to drive job growth. It, it, this this is what he's been doing throughout his career and his life, whether it's with the chamber uh, as the mayor of Worcester, uh, with the lieutenant governor and working in the uh, the uh, Deval Patrick administration. But uh, again, uh, Tim, I, I'm honored and happy that we're able to partner again on the event today and uh, look forward to your welcoming remarks. But uh, again, whatever we can do uh, to support uh, Worcester area small businesses, you know that you can reach out to me um, just an email or a phone call away. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Tim. Bob, thank you. And I, I want to, you know, big shout out to you and Eli and your entire team, not only for your assistance with this Worcesterpreneurs event, but for phenomenal work that you have done over the last 15 uh, months uh, here locally, but also SBA nationally. You know, a very small uh, but important agency within our federal government. And I think the last 15 months, have really reinforced how important SBA is and reinforced how important your presence and your team is locally 
it has literally, literally been the lifeline to so many small businesses. And you guys are punching way above your weight, helping lots of businesses over the past 15 months. And we're enormously grateful for that. Um, so many of our members, so many small businesses, the beneficiaries of your work. And, um, you know, just uh, positive to hear some of the, those stats and data that you just shared with us. And similarly, you know, your partners uh, along uh, this process, especially as it relates to the Paycheck Protection Program, where so many of our, our banks and lenders uh, that, that stepped up and credit unions that just really reinvented themselves to be able to assist our, our businesses. So thank you to that. And I want to acknowledge our sponsors, our, our supporters, our supporters of this event who have uh, been so helpful again over the last 15 months, 15 months, but even prior to in working with so many of our, our businesses. And those supporters include TD Bank, Digital Federal Credit Union, the Workers Credit Union, uh, Bank Hometown, City of Worcester, Country Bank, uh, People's United Bank and Webster Five, as well as our, our supporter, uh, all of them being supporters. And uh, I wanna thank our staff here at the chamber too. They've worked hand in glove with, with the SBA and, and many of our, our local lenders to try to get that timely information to our small businesses uh, during the last 15 months. And uh, uh, for this Worcesterpreneurs event, hopefully this will be our last one virtually. Uh, I want to thank Karen Pelletier for her, her good work, as well as Stephanie Silva, who opened us up and welcomed us. She didn't miss a beat coming on as our new, new program and events coordinator. So I want to personally thank both of them uh, as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jennifer McKay, who is the vice president and business development officer uh, for TD Bank Small Business SBA division. And I uh, want to thank her for and TD Bank for being a supporter of this Worcesterpreneurs Forum. And thank you to all of you who are on. You know, we use three words to organize our work here at the Chamber, recruit, retain, incubate, and big companies eventually started as small companies. And that's our vision and hope for all of you who are joining us today. And thank you to our panelists who help in that process of helping you grow and expand your business. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's great again to be here this year. Uh, TD Bank has now uh, supported this event for four consecutive years, and this is the second year that I'm involved with it. And I'll be serving on a resource panel a little bit later today. Um, so I just wanted to say for those of you who it's your first time coming, it's, it's great that you're here. There's a lot of good information. And for those of you who are here that were also here yet last year, I'm really glad that you came as well, because as everyone's been saying with the pandemic and with PPP and with SBA changes, uh, things are really different than they were a year ago, and we are hoping to get that information out to you today. Uh, so please ask questions, and that's what we're all here for. And with that, I will turn it over to my good friend, Eli Spayu with the SBA. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you, Jennifer. Um, it, it truly is great, you know, to be part of this event for the sixth, you know, consecutive year. And, and you know, what a great partnership we've got with the Worcester Chamber of Commerce. But most importantly, you know, all of the WBRA members who are, are really, you know, make the, the, the Worcester market such a great and friendly ecosystem for, for small businesses, you know. Uh, it, it has been amazing this past 15 months, as, as Bob and, and, and team mentioned, you know, working with so many small businesses, hearing your stories, being able to help you, you know, to, to some level and, and you know, uh, many with, with the various programs that Bob talked about. You know, it, it, it was a little difficult, right, to, to just pick three success stories for this panel. Um, because, you know, so many of you, you know, have shown so much resiliency over the past year and, and, and you know, uh, plus during this pandemic and uh, so many small businesses have truly, you know, thrived even during a pandemic. And, you know, uh, we are grateful here at the SBA for the partnership we've got, um, but just want to give a big shout out to all of the lenders on this call and, and, you know, all of those who participated in the PPP loan program. Um, by far, in my opinion, the greatest public-private partnership uh, that we have seen, as Bob mentioned, you know, we're talking $800 billion in PPP funds in 13 months' time. So record numbers, and, and truly, the SBA could not have done it without the, the help of the lending partners. This, you know, this event will, you know, um, will introduce you to all the different um, 
resources available here in, in the Worcester market. And, uh, you know, I'm going to turn over the mic next to, to Michelle Miller, our, our good friend, the director of the Center for Women and Enterprise here in, in, in the local market. And uh, Michelle is going to introduce, you know, the success story panel, the three businesses, you know, that are going to share with you their experience um, and, and uh, inspire all of us. Um, so, Jennifer, take it away. I'm sorry, Michelle, take it away. Thanks so much, Eli. And I'll echo your thanks. Huge thanks to the Worcester Chamber, Karen, Eli, the WBRA, such an amazing event. So delighted to be here with you all and to introduce you to our panel. Eli did a great job of framing that panel. So I won't add anything other than to say the names of who are here. As Eli said, I'm Michelle Miller with the Central Mass Office of the Center for Women and Enterprise, proud resource partner of the SBA. And I'm here with Lynn Cheney from Maker to Maine, Rick Porter with Cinch IT, and Charles D.B. King with Fast Signs. Uh, really excited to be here with all of you. And let's go ahead and kick us off. Uh, do feel free, by the way, folks, to stick questions in the chat. I know we're a little bit behind, so I'm going to try to get us back. Uh, but please feel free to stick those questions in the chat. And anything that we don't have time for, we'll save that chat and try to get back to you afterwards. Um, also, the panelists are going to be available during networking breaks for any personalized questions that y'all might have. So Lynn, Rick, Charles, it is our time. Let's go. What I'm going to do is ask each of you to introduce yourself, your business, how long you've been in business. Um, and if you haven't already, Lynn is ahead of the game. Stick your info in the chat box so that people can follow up with you would be great. And actually, Lynn, may I start with you to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Good morning, and thank you for including me on this uh, prestigious panel. Uh, it's quite an honor to be part of this. Um, I am Lynn Cheney. I am the CLO, the Chief Local Officer of Maker to Main Market and uh, Food Hub that's located at 328 Main Street, downtown Worcester. Uh, as far as operations are concerned, being in business for almost nine years now, uh, form formerly Lettuce the Local, evolved into Maker Domain and we opened the store on February 21st last year, just three weeks before the pandemic shut down. Nice. Thanks so much, Lynn. Rick, do you mind hopping on? Not at all. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Rick Porter. I'm the president uh, and owner of Cinch IT. We provide computer support to businesses. Uh, we are actually uh, launched as a national franchise just a few years ago. But prior to that, we have been in business since 2004. Excellent. Thanks so much, Rick. And that brings us to Charles. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, my name is Charles King, uh, owner of Fast Science of Worcester. Uh, we're at 120 Stafford Street uh, here in Worcester. It's, Fast Science is actually the largest uh, brand in the uh, science and graphics industry, 750 locations worldwide, about 600 in the US. The Worcester location has been open since 2015. My brother and I acquired it in January of 2020, right before the pandemic. We certainly, despite all the challenges, had a blessed year and were actually uh, able to add on two additional locations in New Jersey. So glad to be on this panel. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. All right. So I'll dive right into some questions for you all. And Lynn, if I could start with you again, I'd love if you could talk us briefly through the evolution of your business, how you've pivoted, changed. Sure. Uh, so uh, I mentioned uh, briefly that uh, Maker Domain is the evolution of Let Us Be Local. Uh, Let Us Be Local was a central mass food hub. We aggregate local food direct from farms and we deliver those products to other farms to keep money locally um, and also to restaurants and breweries, small farm stands and stores and so forth. Uh, started nine years ago, um, always knowing that the goal was to make local food as accessible to everyone and as many people as possible, all demographics, all ages, you name it. Um, the goal was to make it as accessible as possible. And in order to do that, I thought the easiest way to do that was to open a market um, to make local food as accessible as possible. Uh, easy, perhaps not the best term anymore, uh, since I opened the market three weeks before the shutdown last year. And um, my ribbon cutting and grand opening was actually scheduled for March 17th, which is the day that, as we all know, uh, Governor Baker asked everyone to uh, stay home starting on that day. So uh, basically, there was nothing 
here, nothing downtown, nothing was open. And it's uh, really exciting now at this point to see, um, to be stuck in traffic, trying to get downtown uh, again, which is uh, a thought I never thought I would welcome, but I'm very excited to see that still happening. We stayed open the entire time. And essentially we've been, uh, we still offer curbside pickup, um, but the doors have been open to the store every single day. Um, and we're happy to continue making that as possible for everybody. In addition, um, I'm thankful that the whole, our retail market opened because I lost 98% of my wholesale business when the shutdown occurred, when restaurants uh, basically closed up, as we know that's no surprise to anybody um, with what happened in demolishing the restaurant industry as we know it in all food service across the board. And ultimately, we still moved on. So I'm happy to see that uh, somehow we're still here 15 months later and we're making it work and we're relaunching um, and integrating our wholesale division again, which is incredibly exciting. It's clearly no accident that you're still here. You've been doing some amazing things. Thank you. Uh, Charles, I wonder if I could loop back to you. When you were first starting out in Worcester, what were some of the key resources that you needed and how did you access them? Sure. You know, the the key for us to, to come in and acquiring an existing business uh, was try to find opportunities. We really wanted to become a member of the Worcester business community and really the community at large. You know, we wanted to go beyond being transactional, uh, you know, and try to build relationships basically in the city and with other businesses. So that was key for us. And we needed to know what, you know, who to contact, where to go, how, how to network. So it was quite easy uh, when we landed, first of all, at the Worcester Chamber of Commerce. And uh, it, it became very easy from then on. The, the chamber has been very, very helpful, um, basically held our hands throughout. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, Karen has been awesome. Kristen has been awesome. And, and uh, especially during the pandemic, when we would get all those weekly updates and, and information about where to find resources, and a few times when I wasn't sure what to do, I would, I would call, I would call the chamber first and I got tons of answers. I got people calling me back. So just wanted to say, you know, well done to the chamber. Well done, Tim. I mean, you have an amazing team. And then uh, I guess the, the one thing that still wows me is you guys actually call a checkup <laughs> to check up on us. And, and who does that? You know, I get these random phone calls like, hey, just want to know how everything's going and, you know, want to know if we can, we can be of additional help. So well done um, as far as where to find resources for us. Uh, it's been the Worcester Chamber. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks so much, Charles. Uh, Rick, your business is not only established, but it's growing. Do you have a sense, when, when did you or will you feel like you are successful? And what are the metrics that you use when you decide to expand? Oh, uh, metrics. Um, as far as metrics, I don't think that there's um, metrics that, that we use to define our success. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of metrics we use to make decisions. So, you know, when we're looking at our financials, we don't necessarily look at top line revenue. We're more concerned with profitability margins, right? I'd rather have, um, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred clients than a thousand clients if they're profitable clients, right? Um, you know, and I think every industry is a little bit different for us. It's how, you know, how quickly we're getting back to people, how quickly we're resolving computer issues. So there's lots of little metrics that help us make decisions whether it's staffing decisions and things like that. Uh, but, you know, I think for success, I don't think I have a metric for success. And I, I don't know if I'll ever feel successful, but, you know, if you want a funny story, um, I can remember the first time I felt successful was when I hired a landscaper to cut my grass. <laughs> and I know that's ridiculous, but I didn't, I, I grew up in the city of Worcester. I grew up on Grafton Hill. We did not have a ton of money. Um, and so my, my parents worked hard. They did everything themselves. I don't think my dad ever hired anyone to do anything around the house. I thought I was a millionaire when I paid $35 for somebody to cut my grass. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's little things like that, that are more personal to each and every one of us that, you know, makes us feel successful. That's my two cents, at least. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And I love funny stories. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> uh, Charles, I wonder if you could add to that question about expansion. You mentioned you just added a few more sites. I wonder, how do you find and hire the right 
people and what criteria do you use to bring on new employees, managers, staff? Sure. Um, you know, the first uh, to um, as far as a, a metric, uh, just to, to tag on a little bit to what uh, Rick was saying. I mean, you know, we we generally have a rule of uh, knowing to expand when your um, your uh, demand outpaces your capacity. Right. So now, how do you measure that? There are various ways to measure it. Uh, you know, you can use uh, revenue, et cetera. But um, one thing that that we found that was helpful um, is assigning in the beginning a set amount of revenue per headcount. So and then that way, once you exceed that revenue amount, then you can know, well, it's time to add somebody else, because then you you know, you know that in order to keep growing, you need somebody additional. And it's very important to be able to gauge that because you don't want your team to be overworked, you know, and, and that's key. And then when we talk about what we look for when we, when we do hire someone and add someone to the team, the, really the, the main focus for us is to make sure we're the right source for them. Because we, we believe everyone wants to be successful and however they define that personal success. Uh, so whatever their goals are, whatever their dreams are, um, their ambitions are, we try to find out what that is and then identify whether we're the right fit for them. And then, you know, um, yeah, after that, once we get them on board, we kind of look at kind of like the three E's, equip, empower, and encourage. You know, because if we get them the right tools, um, and then give them the ability to go out, they actually end up making our business better. And really, I, I think our, our success, uh, we've, we've certainly been blessed to have great people uh, that have been able to take uh, you know, the tools that we've given and the ability to go out and, and do things for our business. And they've, they've expanded our business and we, we're grateful for that. I appreciate that. And I especially appreciate the idea of making sure that, that it's a right fit with your clients. A lot of times we try to be everything to everyone as business owners and that's not possible. It's not even always the right thing to aim for. All right. Lynn, I will twist back to you. I love your store. And I think anyone who's been in it has fallen in love. Also your Instagram, you kill it with your Instagram feed. I wonder if you could talk to me about how important you feel the customer experiences in your business and how you work to maximize their experience in person and online because you're reaching a little place. Yeah, sure. The uh, so that's kind of a, a multiple faceted question. There um, has um, multiple answers, but I would say, um, in short, uh, the customer experience is absolutely everything. It's everything for your business, both online and in person. And uh, we kind of pay homage to uh, a throwback to an old school scenario where you know your people knew their butcher, they knew their the, the guy that was delivering milk to them, they knew all of those um, people that they would have a relationship with that provided their food source for them. Uh, and that's certainly no different than the experience of knowing your farmer and the person who produced that product for you. So we are very transparent in explaining all of the 150 plus different farmers and growers and makers that are part of our network um, and that we source from uh, on a daily basis. And we also make sure that when they step into our store, it is, uh, an experience that one, they feel comfortable, they're gonna get the answers and the products that they're seeking. And also that it brings us joy in that process. So as soon as someone walks in and they're greeted by one of um, either myself or one of the other girls that works with me, um, we wanna see if they've been here before. And typically we can tell, even though we have only seen pretty much all this with a mask for the majority of the time that we've been open. So we're probably gonna have to relearn all of our customer base. And once people take masks off, cause we're not gonna know who anybody is. Um, but essentially we've, uh, we make it a unique, a personal experience and everyone wants to feel important and happy and feel um, part of a community. And my store is very much that experience for people. So whether they're looking for something as a small gift that's unique, or they're looking for something to have for dinner, or they're just running in because they went to the office for the first time in you know eight months and now need to find a little snack or something simple to bring back to the office, uh, we can kind of cater to all of that. And it is very, very important that we have a customer experience and a one-on-one -on -one working experience without being obtrusive to customers and knowing that 
uh, is also incredibly important. Uh, online, that's a whole different ball game. So trying to keep up with responding to people's questions and so forth is in, that's like a full-time job in of itself. I'm very grateful that I have Joy um, who handles a lot of our social media because let's face it, I'm a dinosaur. So when it comes to me having to do those things, I'm not very good at it, um, but uh, she is incredible at it. And she, um, we talk daily on how to kind of keep people engaged and excited about what's new in the store because we're excited about it. We're excited that we finally just brought the first asparagus in. And I know it seems real stupid, but there is a sense of hope that happens when we harvest the first, the first asparagus of the season that we've somehow made it through the ducks of winter and we're now like full speed ahead all the way to the end of the year with the abundance of local food that is gonna trickle into the store at that point. So yeah. customer experience is number one in relationship building. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I do think it's exciting when you when you reach those milestones in your business, fresh produce, getting set up, that, that is so meaningful on so many levels. Um, okay, so let me shift back to Rick, if I may. Let's start chatting about tech. What technology do you recommend to other business owners? Do you use anything like Autoboot, Slack, anything like that that you just couldn't live without? Uh, for new business owners, I think there's there's a lot of technology options. Uh, my advice to people is actually to keep it simple, to be very honest with you. Uh, mm -hmm. The nice part is this last year has forced almost everyone to adopt some sort of technology that's getting them up and running, right? So if you haven't even started your own business, you're probably on Zoom or Teams or, or maybe Slack, like you mentioned, right? Um, stick with the basics to start. Don't overcomplicate it. Start with an email. If there's any one piece of technology that I would recommend to somebody getting started or just, just starting their business, it's actually their website. I know it sounds a little crazy, but I think that people should spend a lot of time on their website and very, very early on. I'm a big believer that the website can actually help design and improve your business when you're first getting started. I'll give you an example, you know, basic stuff like developing a logo and a color scheme and kind of designing the look and the feel that you want your company to have, whether it's professional or humorous. But then as you work through your website, right, maybe you get to an about us page. Well, great. Tell us what your mission statement is. What's your vision for your company? You have to define that on that page. So if you haven't done it as a business owner, it's going to force you to do it, right? Um, you get to something like a contact us page. Great. Do you actually have a phone number? Do you have a, an email address, right? How are you going to list those things? So believe it or not, I think starting with a website helps you to find so many pieces of your business that you might not have thought about before. So I say start with your website. I couldn't agree more. Nope. Lynn, same question to you. And or is there anything that you've adopted specifically for COVID that you think you're going to continue using? Um, well, so as I mentioned, technology is actually a challenge for us in many ways, uh, predominantly because uh, for people to find this location and where I am in a basically a, a whole main street that doesn't have a ton of things open currently um, and hasn't for the last year. Technology in general has been incredibly uh, helpful. And I would say predominantly on the social media side, uh, we rely so, so heavily on Facebook and Instagram for people to find us and to keep them informed on the ever-changing process that's happening within the store on a daily basis. And also uh, highlighting all of our restaurant partners and farm network and uh, constantly promoting that our community that we're building through through social media. Um, on the flip side, though, as far as software is concerned, that is not social media heavy, that is strictly for using um, like our POS system and our online ordering system is absolutely the worst. Um, I've had so many challenges with our POS system, so many to the point where I have considered saying, you know what, let's just use a calculator and a pen and paper because this is awful. Um, the amount of times that we literally, uh, I was basically sold uh, some, some lies in how we um, launched our online um, portal for people and our POS system that was supposed to report inventory accurately. And in the midst of a pandemic where literally all of my staff I had to send home because they had 
childcare challenges and or another significant other in their house that needed to work that they couldn't and so on and so forth. It was it was me and a POS system that I tried to push online uh, probably six months prematurely and it was uh, plagued from day one. Uh, we have since figured it out, um, which is great. It took us all the way until about October for us to actually figure out what the reporting problem was in inventory and so forth. So I would say, do your homework on implementing anything that is vital to your business when it comes to technology. Uh, I thought I had done my homework. I did not do enough. And understanding how to foresee the challenges that could have arose from, I mean, no one could have seen that we were going to have a pandemic and that this was going to happen. But I always knew that my online port, that the POS system was going to be launched for online. And I didn't do enough homework to figure that out prior. So food for thought, no pun intended. Um, definitely do your homework on any device that you're going to use. But I do I do firmly think that um, obviously the website idea as well, that's an, that's definitely a valuable tool, especially if even having a landing page, something that people can go to to get a few tidbits of information about your business is vital to starting up. Absolutely, absolutely. And it can be challenging to find the time to do your homework, right, because you're trying to run your business. But I feel you, you've got to you save your time in spades if you do it up front. All right, Charles, coming back to you. There are so many businesses that have closed or are really struggling right now. I'm wondering if you could talk about how you think an entrepreneur can build resiliency into their business. Yeah, um, great question, Michelle. Uh, first, I, I want to just go back to Rick's point about the website. Uh, it, it really is a great tool uh, and it helps you see your business as uh, customers would be seeing your business uh, and it really helps you build it out. And what Lynn also said earlier on about relationship building with customers. Uh, you know, uh, those are very good, very good points. Um, you know, and to the question about building resiliency, 2020 was a really tough year for, for most, if not all businesses, regardless of, you know, how you came out of it. Uh, um, there were so many challenges, you know, and I will say as far as building resiliency, I, I think one thing that as entrepreneurs, we talk about, we know it's in the back of our mind, but we, we don't get to enough or we kind of neglect it is having a business plan. You should have a business plan and you should have a solid business plan. And I tell people, don't pay someone else to write your business plan unless you're gonna be very closely involved with it. You really should write the plan yourself. Uh, and, and in your business plan, I think you wanna account for five main areas of risk in your business plan and how you're gonna address them. And those areas of risk include how you're gonna address any competitive factors, any competitive changes in the market. How you gonna how you gonna address micro uh, micro market changes? You know anything in your immediate vicinity, anything that changes. Um, Macroeconomic conditions. You know in case there's a recession. Um, you know how how are you gonna address that? And also, of course, in your business plan, you should address your operations plan if things change. Uh, things change if you have if you have a key team member that that quits. If you have uh, you know uh, if it's difficult to find a specific talent, so you're proactive. I think that should be in your plan. And then you should address risk, you know, risk of statutory changes. So depending on your business, there may be rules, uh, um, guidelines, and and laws that affect how you operate and and how you do business. And I think you need to prepare for that. Now you say, well, of course, we you can put all those things in, and nothing would have prepared us for a pandemic. And I'll say, yes, my business plan did did not have anything about a pandemic. Uh, you know, um, however, we did plan for natural disasters and. Being in New England, we plan for natural disasters and weather impacts. So when the pandemic happened, we actually resorted, we went to our business plan. Uh, we didn't have to wing much and it called for working remotely and relying on the Fast Science Network and other vendor partners to actually be able to, uh, to fulfill orders if we didn't have the capacity. And having that plan really helped us pull through. So I really think, um, you know, have a business plan, uh, revisit it, you should work on it and be involved in coming with that business plan. And then I think you should regularly review it and amend it uh, as conditions change. Music to my ears, I cannot. <laughs> All right, friends, we have precious few minutes remaining in this panel. I wonder if we could really quick for our panelists, you are 
expert entrepreneurs at this point. And I'm wondering if you have any last words, sage advice to today's attendees, one lesson learned that you can leave folks with. Um, well, I can jump in here and say yeah. that uh, you as an entrepreneur, you are your business. So the idea of balancing work and life is a very different experience for an entrepreneur um, than it is for someone that uh, is employed for a, a, a different, as an employee, essentially. Um, you will always be the one taking those phone calls in the middle of a family function, and you're the one that is going to have to get up and figure out something at two in the morning or whatever the case may be. That never goes away, but you have to learn how to find a balance between those things because you are your business. Um, in, in conjunction with that, I would say, because you are your business, know when to put, walk away. Know when you've done everything you can and that road that you keep trying to push down is not opening or that door is not opening or that path is changing. Know when it's time to pivot and make a change uh, for better or for worse. And um, it will help you grow and move forward um, in your entire career. Absolutely agree, Lynn. Charles, Rick, what do you guys think? Well, um, sorry, Rick, to, to, to jump in over here. Well, I, I mean, I, I think for me, what uh, comes to mind is if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, I think very early on, establish core values for your, for your business and yourself. And, and as, as Lynn was saying, know what you can handle, know what you can't handle. Uh, you know, and I would say don't, having that, those core values and making decisions, whether it's planning or strategic decisions, always revert back to those core values so that you're not jumping on the next train or the next trend only to find out, uh, you know, that, that's not really your cup of tea or what you're capable of. And if someone else is, is successful at doing something, whether it's a competitor or, or even someone, you know, or a colleague, um, you know, it, it's, it's great, support them. But before you choose to, you know, to jump on that bandwagon, know if you know if that really is a core business for you and don't neglect your you know your existing strength to pursue something else all right rick it's all you all right i gotta wrap it up here's yeah. i guess <laughs> here's what i would say probably the best piece of advice i ever got um i swung for the fence when i took it and it's probably one of the most beneficial things i ever did is find a mentor early okay find a mentor not just any mentor but somebody who's been there and done that and been successful, if you can find somebody who's done it in your industry and has been successful, even better. My challenge to everyone would be this. Find someone who is such a great mentor that you're 99.9% .9 sure they're going to say no or they're going to ignore your email or your LinkedIn request because you'll be shocked how many people will be willing to say yes? Um, I've been in business since 2004, but I started franchising my business in 2018. And I, had, I still have so much to learn. What I did was I reached out to someone who was at the top of the game in franchising. Somebody who, I mean, flies on a private jet kind of person. And I just started to connect. I actually sent beer to his house. I stocked him that much. <laughs> but I, but I, I reached out to him multiple times looking for a mentor. And eventually he said yes. And it's the best piece of advice I can get, ever give to anybody. The chamber also I know has these mentorship programs. I see a bunch of uh, people in attendance here. Allison Tizoma, for example, uh, Rob Del Mastro, you know, they were they were kind of founding members of the Chamber's business owner discussion group, where you know they get a small group together to talk about what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and they're their support system and that mentorship. So you can get it at the look at the, at your chamber level, but think big as well and reach out to our mentor. Read. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. If you're looking for somewhere else to send beer, Rick. I'm around, um, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much everybody. I haven't seen any questions in the chat and we're just about at end anyway. So what I will do is I'm gonna transition us over to the amazing Stephanie Silva, uh, but these folks will be around. They put all their contact info in the chat and they'll be available in the breakouts. So thanks so much everyone for being here and have a great weekend.
Thank My you. goodness, Michelle, thanks thank you. to you. That was phenomenal. Charles, Rick, Lynn, oh my goodness. I don't think I could write down things fast enough. That was phenomenal. Thank you, thank you, thank you to you all. Phenomenal panel. Okay, so we are gonna go into our first round of breakout rooms. So um, Karen is just going to miraculously and magically place you all into these breakout rooms. So I just wanna let you guys know that you are gonna receive a little pop-up box. So please make sure that you're looking at your screen um, that you will accept to go into a random breakout room. We're gonna have representatives um, sort of uh, breakout room captains in there to help guide your conversations. And we're gonna be assigning them to you. So um, go into your breakout rooms when you can, just give us a minute. All right, I think I got out. <laughs> what was that? I'm looking for um, the country bank guy. I don't know if you saw him in the waiting room a million times. He couldn't get in, so. I know, yeah. I will, hopefully, I didn't see anyone else from country bank, but if someone one. does, they need to go number four. All righty. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, looks like everybody is back, and we're hoping you know to have everyone in in this general session. You know, uh, every year you would. Eli, you muted yourself. Eli, you muted. All righty. Uh, well, welcome back, everyone. So. Uh, <laughs> I hope everyone found those breakout sessions to be, you know, uh, helpful and you got to meet some folks that you hadn't met before, you know, learn about the various resources through the, the WBRA membership and the partners here in, in, the, in, the, in the Worcester market. But uh, I said this once before, you know, we are fortunate here in, in Worcester County to have so many resources available. You know, the ecosystem here for, for small businesses is extremely friendly. You know, uh, we have mentors, which Rick mentioned earlier, uh, through the SCORE, uh, you know, uh, chapter here in Worcester, you know, the, the resources through the chamber, resources through the various WBRA members, truly an amazing, amazing network we have. But, you know, speaking of resources, we're going to be you know, starting this next session. Um, we're going to have three, you know, uh, resources uh, available to small businesses to share some words of wisdom for you all. But uh, we, we have a phenomenal moderator for that for that next session. And uh, uh, Dr. Deborah Jackson, the, the Dean of the Foise School of, of Management at, at WPI uh, is, uh, you know, is going to moderate this, this next session. So, uh, Dr. Jackson, it's I'll pass the mic over to you, and uh, please introduce the, the, the resource panels for us. The resource panel for us. All right, thank you, Eli. Good at, good morning. We're still morning, Lord. It seems like we've had such a full day already that it should be afternoon. I don't know about you, but I am all jazzed from the conversations that we've already had. And given that we've had these conversations, you're inspired, your businesses are ready to flourish. Now you gotta talk about how you're gonna resource it. And so this is the panel discussion for you. We have Karen Sapatelli of Acorn Business Advisors, 
Brianna DeBella of Studio DeBella and Jennifer McKay of TD Bank. So what we're gonna do in this session, very much like the previous one, the session and the questions will probably take up most of the time, but I invite you, encourage you even, to use the chat to pose any questions that you might have. And if we have time, we'll get back to those. But I would remind you that our panelists will be available during our networking breaks later this morning that you can ask personalized questions. So let's get on with it. By way of introduction, why don't you tell us who you are, your company, and something that we would not know about you based on your LinkedIn profile. Let's start with Karen, and then Bree, and then Jennifer. All right, Deborah. thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, I am. I'm Karen Sepatelli. I'm an enrolled agent with the IRS, and my I'm the owner of Acorn Business Advisors. I've been in business for just over 19 years now. And something people wouldn't know about me from my LinkedIn profile. Let's see. I guess for are you looking for a personal or business? <laughs> Well, whatever you'd like to do. Whatever I'd like to do. <laughs> I guess it's not really in my profile that I enjoy bike riding. I enjoy hiking. I like getting out. But it's also been a great way during the pandemic to meet with uh, business owners and clients. Just so say, okay, why don't we go for a walk? It's a lot safer and it's actually very nice. It's a good way to meet people. So, Absolutely. Great, great ideas. Brie. Thank you. Um, so my name is Brianna DeBella. Most people call me Brie. I own Studio DeBella based in Worcester. Um, I have a lot of personal interests on my LinkedIn, so I'll go with a career note. Um, one highlight not there that took place in the last few days of my employment, actually, well, after I'd given my notice, um, my last job before starting the company, I was asked to be, um, to give the introduction to the CEO I worked for at an event at the Organization of American States in Washington, DC. And it was a huge honor for me. I got to meet ambassadors and um, really connect with people from all over the world. So that was a pretty exciting and um, positive way to end that last chapter of my career. Oh, that is outstanding. That I, I would love that. Um, congratulations for that. I'm sure you'll carry that for the rest of your, your life and career experiences. So thank you for sharing. I'd invite everyone to mute if you haven't, other than the speakers. But uh, then, Jennifer, tell us about yourself. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Jennifer McKay. I am an SBA lender at TD Bank. I have been in the banking industry for about 25 years and pretty much for the last decade, I've been focusing exclusively on SBA products. Uh, something that uh, people would not know about me, I suppose would be I have four children and one grandchild. And during the pandemic, uh, we were very much, you know, struggling trying to figure out what we can do for an activity. So we had to find a little bit of a silver lining and we bought a pandemic boat. So now when I'm not banking, you will find my family on Webster Lake um, every chance that we get. Um, so we were able to at least get a really good family activity out of the pandemic. So we could at least find something. That is outstanding. Everybody needs those kinds of outlets. I, I love that. And, and we did some of that with my family as well. So now shifting back into the resource kind of conversations, and I'm going to pose this question to Brianna and to Karen. In your current position, how do you help small businesses and entrepreneurs? So I offer consultation on brand development and marketing strategies, as well as creative production services. I work with a wide range of professionals from new business owners to experienced owners and even directors of specific teams like marketing teams or creative teams. Um, I also help people leverage their creative and marketing to overcome business challenges that they're having, uh, to take advantage of opportunities in the market that they're in and overall just present their best selves. 
Okay, and what I do is, I mean, bookkeeping and accounting are necessary to do the taxes, to stay compliant with the government, and as a number of my clients say, keep them out of jail. But there's also another thing that can be done with all of that. Once you do the bookkeeping, the accounting, you can do tax planning, you can do business planning, you can use that information to help you run your business and grow your business. So if you have to do it all to fill out a tax return anyway, why not get the most out of it? And that's where I like to add value for my clients. And I just love to see them grow. And one of the best things for me in my business is getting that phone call, you know, or a text message from a client. Hey, you know, they just got their biggest contract ever, you know, whatever happens in their business. So I really like to partner with them and help and, you know, help them along their growth process. See, and that, and that's perfect. That's, that's exactly what we need, right? As, as entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. you need someone that's going to be able to provide that support so you can focus on your business and, and, and both of those answers are perfect in that regard. So Jennifer, let me ask you, what suggestions would you make to a new business or an existing business that is seeking bank financing? And how is that different now in the, the time of a pandemic than it might've been prior to? Um, thank you. Uh, so right now, um, I still have to say that even, you know, with the pandemic, I'm not going to change from what I said a year ago, that SBA is still most likely going to be your best product, assuming that you're in an eligible industry, but it's actually even more true today than last year. So what's happened is, you know, and I'm not, I swear Eli is not paying me, um, but I, I do need to talk about the SBA programs because they are that good. So the, the SBA made some changes this year and through their, the end of their fiscal year, there are no government guarantee fees. And that is huge. So now this is really level playing field as a conventional loan. But what they also did was they increased on a 7A loan what used to be a 75% guarantee to a 90% guarantee. So what is that doing? Well, that's mostly important to the bank because it's going to allow us to take still an educated risk, but a larger educated calculated risk now that we are going to have a 90% guarantee. Um, so, you know, so those are huge game changers. The other until funds are exhausted with the Economic Aid Act, when you close on that SBA loan, you also could be eligible for, is it still three months, uh, Eli, of payments on that? Um, Different programs are changing frequently, so I figured I better check because I haven't today. (laughs) Um, But, you know, three months of payments um, up to a capped amount of $9,000 a month. So these programs that are out there right now are are just so beneficial to the the borrower, to the entrepreneur, that we're seeing um, requests that we have never seen before. Volume is up extremely high. So my other area of advice would be, Whatever, however long you think it's going to take you to get financing when you're working on an agreement, whether it's to purchase a business or to purchase a real estate, piece of real estate, plan on at least 30 days longer. Um, you know, do that right now for yourself. It's better to do that than to have to come back later. And in regards to when you're talking to your bank, if you are an existing business looking to expand, make sure that your accounting is available, if not on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis. That is becoming very important in analyzing 2020. We need to understand the impact that COVID has had on your business and we need to understand what you're going to look like from the from COVID. So there's a lot, you know, that we need to look at differently this year. So we want to make sure that we understand where your business was hit and when the cycle started coming back up. 
the monthly statements are going to help us see that. You know, and in some cases, we'll do a quarterly trailing analysis, which is going to help us normalize your revenues. So as a bank, we're looking to try to approve you. So we are, you know, I'm just telling you in advance, make sure that you're able to supply that because most banks are going to want that right now. It's going to help get your loan approved. Good words, good recommendations. And, and, you know, these are the resources that are going to help you be able to do the, these kinds of calculations. You don't have to do this, but you can work with um, advisors, with teams of folks, with the SBA that's going to be able to help you plot that course and demonstrate the performance of, of your organization, your company, um, to help you get the kind of resourcing you need for the future. That's wonderful information. Karen, let me ask you, is there specific advice that you would share for doing business in a pandemic? See, specific advice was don't let all of the reporting, the bookkeeping, and the taxes fall behind. I mean, business owners have been slammed in so many different ways, trying to do so many things. But, you know, as we, you know, just, you know, heard from Jennifer, you know, when they're doing loans, when they're trying to help businesses, banks need that financial information. So it's so important to keep that up. You know, keep up the monthly reconciliations, keep up the reporting and just, keep up everything. And if you weren't doing everything before, now's a good time to start. That's absolutely true. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's funny you say that. I uh, worked with a, a, a prior client where mm -hmm. I was just helping them file extensions for taxes so that they have time to put some things in place because they hadn't kept up the way that they needed to. Um, but thankfully, there was some supports for them uh, to be able to get back on track. Let me, let me continue now, and, and I would remind you that you can ask questions. We'd love to have your questions during this time, and, and certainly, uh, you know, we have this great panel, and we don't want you to miss out. Now, you think about, um, and, and I, I think about this question in terms of um, minoritized populations and some of the challenges getting resources sometimes, but people tend to do business with people they know they like or trust, and let me add, that look like them <laughs> in your experience. So then how important is it to nurture ongoing relationships and to be a part of communications with others in your resource network, even if doing so extends the sales cycle, the business cycle, and, and I would ask all of you this question. And, and if you were thinking about this, how is it different when you're advising a brick and mortar versus a click um, online organization company? Maybe you might share some stories. I'll start on this one. Um, so I'd say, Relationships are pretty much everything uh, with business. And I think it's one of the places to focus the most on as a business owner. Um, and I also just to extend that, I think it applies not just to sales, but with your business partnerships and your employees as well for retention and growth. Um, with online businesses specifically, there are some great email drip campaign strategies that can help you nurture relationships with your prospective um, clients and customers, and you can even automate much of those processes to really uh, work at scale for you, even when you're sleeping. Um, and I'd say those are kind of the two key, key pieces of advice I have to give. Yeah, I'll also add, I mean, with what I do with business owners, I'm essentially asking them to bear their entire financial soul to me. And that is a lot. And it almost feels sometimes like people are confessing to me because I'm the first person they may have told like, okay, I haven't reconciled the book since. Um, I had a call this morning from a gentleman, a business owner, and he hasn't filed his taxes since 2017. 
And I'm not sure he told anybody that beforehand, that sort of thing. So relationships are very important. I think, especially when we're working with businesses, you know, we need businesses to tell us what's going on. We need to know the good, the bad, the ugly, so that we can help them. And especially in these times, so we can help them get through this and get through whatever issues they are dealing with as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Um, so the only thing that I would add on to that is, you know, just how important communication is um, in, you know, this conversation that we're having right now. Um, we, I think a lot of us gravitate towards, you know, businesses that we know, um, business people that we like to do business with, people that we trust. Um, we surround ourselves with trusted advisors every day. Um, you know, so I, I do believe that those relationships stay for a very long time. Um, I'm a transactional lender. I no longer get to maintain my own portfolio because I'm specialized. Um, but for the brief time that I do come into a transaction, um, I do immerse myself into it with the individual um, because like it was just said by Karen, they are really bearing their soul to you. They, you are finding out every piece of information about their life. And that, you know, does not necessarily come easily, especially in a pandemic right now where a lot of us are virtual. Um, you know, so I know one thing that I've done is I'll do loans from Florida to Maine that now that everybody is using Zoom or a virtual platform or WebEx, I actually have been utilizing virtual meetings a lot. If I can't meet the customer in person, then I can at least meet them face to face on a screen. It's not ideal, but it is better than email and it is better than just a simple phone call because I think it's best when you're doing business with somebody to be able to look at that person. Um, that body language communication, that is what you trust. That becomes so important. So that's why, I mean, I think that for me, I could probably continue to do business like this even post pandemic, but as long as others are willing to still incorporate the virtual part of it, because that piece is so needed. Um, so that's my, my big take. Trusted advisors, do business with people that you know and trust and communicate regularly. You know, you bring up an interesting point to me, um, Jennifer, that you know, the reality of this virtual environment and what we've all had to go through in this last year is that we're not going to return to the business as usual prior to. I mean, I, I think that we're always going to have some sort of a hybridized environment. And so what are you seeing? Maybe all of you can respond to that as well. What do you see? What, what's your forecast of what will go back to what we were doing the way we were doing before and what might stay online and how, how as, as someone is looking for resources and supports, how do you navigate that? Oh, Jennifer, do you want to start? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll just speak to that. I, I gained quite a lot of new clients through the pandemic and building those relationships for the first time with new people that I didn't know um, was all happened through Zoom. <laughs> so uh, I definitely grew confident that it was possible. Um, I joined a couple groups as well and have met a lot of people through that through Zoom events. Um, I don't I don't know that, I think we're all very excited to be in person again, um, but I actually think I'll still be integrating Zoom uh, quite heavily throughout the work week, just because it's convenient to meet with people this way. Everyone has busy schedules and traveling to and from office visits isn't always um, efficient, efficient way to spend your time um, as a business owner. So I'm excited about what this has opened up just for the business world. Um, it makes access a little bit easier for people that um, wouldn't otherwise be able to meet face-to-face, uh, -face, even if it's virtual. Okay. Um, I really have to uh, agree with Bree on that. You know, I also have gained clients virtually that I have never met in person, and I find it doesn't affect the relationship at all because we have met 
you know, on Zoom, on video, that sort of thing. And with what I do, it's very easy for me to work with clients virtually. And what I have found is so many have said it's easier for them as well. When my business first started, obviously we didn't have any of this. I was working with many small business owners and I would you know, go to their office, AKA the kitchen table. Um, so when you know, everything went online and stuff like that, I wasn't sure how people were going to respond to it, but the response was so positive with the biggest reaction, oh good, I don't need to clean my house once a month for you, which I thought was really quite funny. So I think, you know, even before this, a lot of my stuff had transferred online, but it is so convenient. It's convenient for the business owner as well, because let's face it, business owners, things come up. They need to put out fires. And if they need to cancel an appointment with me five minutes before, but we're just on Zoom, that is so much easier for them than if I just drove 45 minutes to see them and I'm, si and I'm sitting at the door. So I That's think a lot true. of this is going to continue. Jennifer? I agree with that as well. Uh, I, I think that we're able to do things now that we weren't able to do before. Uh, we can meet easier. We can um, handle uh, electronic signatures. We, we That was one thing that we certainly had to be able to handle. Uh, we had to learn to handle remote loan, loan closings. Um, I know probably most people know someone who refinanced a home mortgage during this time period and signed documents in their driveway. Um, you know, so people are doing things a, a lot differently and, you know, watch for the fun stuff too. Um, I'm part of a networking group and I've gotten to do some really, really neat things that I never would have gotten to do otherwise. I did a virtual elephant safari in Africa. Um, I've done virtual um, cooking shows, which I'm not good in the kitchen. Let's just say I'm, I'm a better, I, I belong banking, not cooking. Um, at least virtually, nobody could completely see how much I screwed things up. Um, but those were a lot of the fun things that I, I wouldn't have otherwise gotten to do and opportunities to, you know, take virtual tours of the Pearl, of Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, so really neat things that are being offered. And so keep your eye out because these are things that I probably never would have gone to or seen, but that somebody else is, is sitting in that country and we're communi communicating now across the world and we're learning different things virtually, that's become part of my day now. Um, you know, so that right there, um, and my day starts earlier. Working from home, yay, I can start at 5 a.m. and I can be ready by 3.30 when my kids can't take anymore. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, God love you. Um, starting at 5 a.m., I'm, I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely, I, I understand that, you know, being in these conversations, I mean, just even in the last breakout, um, had it not been for the last breakout, I wouldn't have met some great folks that now I'll be able to follow up and, and have some deeper conversations. So that's, that's what this uh, environment has given us and truly necessity was the mother of invention during this time frame. We could either figure out how to do these things or stop functioning and stop functioning certainly was not an option. So now that we're all jazzed, we've got ideas, we're ready to go and launch our business and our entrepreneurial spirit can fly. Jennifer, how do I start this process of obtaining a loan and what might I do if I don't qualify? Uh, for starters, I think right now it's important to search to see what grants are available, um, what type of um, programs. There are so many right now for um, for to stimulate the economy. So definitely look for those that you might qualify for, um, both at the state and at the federal level. Uh, and in regards to, you know, starting that loan process, I would recommend pick up the phone, talk to your you know, local banker um, or store manager, something like TD. Yes, our stores are open, but they'll put you in contact with the right person who 
for the loan size that you're looking for, um, because you want to make sure that you're talking to the right person. If it's an SBA loan, make sure you're talking to somebody who does SBA loans. Um, you, you know, you just need to make sure of what you're looking for. Uh, I'm sorry, here's another part. What was the second part of your question? Um, about, oh, sorry, um, resources if you don't qualify. Um, I think that if you look at the chat, you're going to see that several individuals have put their information into that chat. There are both nonprofit and for-profit avenues that you can explore. So those are all available. Um, talk to the chamber. Um, they'll put you in the right, you know, right path towards some of the nonprofit groups. Um, but I definitely take take advantage of or utilize the people that are in the chat today uh, because they're serving small businesses and startups and you might just need to team up with one of them as a trusted advisor to get started. Absolutely. And, and what a great point. The conversation, the resources that we've even heard about already today, um, it, so much of this is you don't know what you don't know. And being able to talk to folks to to get ideas, to make connections is really quite critical. You know, as I, I, you know, each of you have had such wonderful journeys. So Brianna, reflecting on your own journey, what advice do you have for our attendees today, especially those looking to take their businesses to the next level? Thanks for the question. Yeah, I've, um, we talked about relationships before, but I'll just say for those of you who, are starting a business in a community that's new to them or your community is still small here in the Worcester area. Um, I've lived in a few cities in my career and each time I really had to start from square one on building a professional network and friendships too. <laughs> um, so I spent a lot of time and money in some cases to grow those networks and it was well worth the investment every time, um, even when before I had started a business. Uh, I'd say that when you, my piece of advice for if you're paying to join a professional network, whether it be a chamber or um, even just a group, that, that consider it like any other investment, make sure that you're spending the time to really leverage that, that all the opportunities that that network um, can bring to you. I like to think of um, the chamber membership as a door that opens to just a room full of opportunities and people that could be helpful to you and your business. So. Um, Yes, continue to nurture those relationships when you meet people like in events like today, um, but keep coming back and let people get to know who you are and what you have to offer as well. What a great suggestion. Since we have time and since you all have been bashful about your questions, let me pose the same question to Jennifer. Um, what advice do you have for our attendees today, especially those looking to take their businesses to the next level? Uh, I, again, I, I think you need to establish who your trusted advisors are. You need to utilize them frequently. Um, if you are, you know, pulling out one of, you know, those old business plans that's been sitting on the shelf, dust it off, uh, make all the adjustments um, that are needed um, because it is a completely different environment than it was a year ago. Um, but listen to others in your industry. Uh, I feel that we can learn best from our competitors and we, you know, competition is only going to make us better. But I think that in this community, I, I think that we are helping each other. So I think if you find another business that's in your industry, hopefully you can help each other out um, and, and define best practices. Uh, working together, this is what this community needs right now to get through this. Absolutely. Karen? I'd say I, I'll piggyback on the you don't know what you don't know. And that is so important. I received an email from a new client asking me when Venmo was going to send out the W-2s. There wasn't too much we could do at that point. But, you know, one of the things that you can do to counteract that you don't know what you don't know is joining a chamber, joining a networking group, because there are speakers in all different areas that rotate, um, that you can learn from. So even if you didn't know what to ask, just listening to other business owners and what they do can help you realize, oh, I hadn't thought of that. I need to do that in my business as well. 
So, you know, learn, learn from each other, lean on each other, and by all means, you know, call the chamber and, um, and just ask, they are wonderful. Absolutely, I found that already um, working with the chamber, with, with Karen and with, with Tim, what, what a gift they are to the community um, and helping us to connect. So that's exactly right. So if you're like me, you leave these conversations and you think, oh, I should have said this. I should have left someone with this nugget piece of information. So let me ask the question, what, what would you want to make sure if we haven't already covered it? Jennifer, what would you tell someone that we, if you haven't already covered it, maybe you're not like me, you've done, you've said everything and you've been wonderfully cogent and exciting and interesting. And so you're like, I'm all set. But, but is there anything that we haven't said that maybe you want to leave people with? Plan, plan, adjust, and plan. <laughs> you need to constantly keep adjusting right now to what's going on around us and, you know, put that plan out there, um, define where you want to be, understand what your goals are, um, but be ready to also have some other plans in there because um, things just keep changing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Karen. Um, the other part of plan, plan, plan is document, document, document. <laughs> yes. That sort of thing. Document your plan, write it down. Make sure you have documents for all of your expenses, your income, your business plans. Write down those passwords in a very safe place you know, to get into that bank account and everything else. You know, a good document trail can help your business. It helps at tax time. It just helps in so, so, so many things. And I can say like sometimes when I'm trying to argue something with the IRS, mass DOR, the client will be like, well, yes. I'm like, all right, do you have it in writing? Do you have a note? Did you keep a diary? They're like, it's in my head and I'm like, I can't submit your memory to the IRS. So document, document that plan and document everything. I love it, I love it. And how about you, Bree? Um, well, I think I'll just end this. I totally agree with Jennifer and Karen. Um, and all that I'll add here is that I think as a business owner, keeping humility and vulnerability on the table when you're doing business is important. Um, we're all human beings at the end of the day. So when you're asking for help or when you're offering help, um, just being able to show up as your full self and, and even when things don't go well, just being honest um, and having communication about those things. I think that's so key to doing business and building relationships with other people. Absolutely. Now, you know, and, and, even as I moved toward a close, of course we got a question that I'm really des delighted about. Um, so I, I, you know, whoever feels best prepared to answer this, does an SBA loan get approved by credit score? So there's a couple of different ways that this could be explained. And, you know, there's, there is the bank's credit um, policy. So you need to, you know, whatever your bank is, you need to be in line with whatever their credit policy is. So I, you know, there may or may not be at your bank a particular credit score that's needed. Um, so I always say it goes by content of what is on that score. You know, what that score is comprised of is more what I look at. But I do know that for some smaller size SBA loans, that there is a credit scoring process where there is a minimum set um, credit score. Um, and Eli, I'm gonna call out on you only because I don't do the smaller size loans, um, but the the credit score, is it below loans below 350 that have the, the credit score figure? Yes, yes, Jennifer. It's loans under $350,000 that have that proprietary SBA credit scoring model. But in, in general, as you know it, you know, all uh, credit will require some some form of credit score. 
And I, but I did have um, a customer recently who came to me up front to say, hey, I'm going to, uh, I want to apply for a loan, but I always run into a problem because a credit score is not produced. And it actually, I've never seen that before until this, this was the first time. And it actually said, um, not enough credit used to, to calculate a score. Um, you know, so knowing that ahead of time that he was able to forewarn me about that, I was able to have that department, you know, a conversation with my credit department, you know, and we said, that's not a problem. As long as it's not derogatory or, you know, being able to explain it, um, we're not going to fault you for not having a credit score either. But that is a very, very rare. I've been doing this for 25 years, and that is the first time I've encountered somebody that does not even produce a credit score. Thank you so much. You know, this has been uh, such an informative time. I'm so very grateful to the expertise of Karen Sapatelli, of Acorn Business Advisors, Brianna DiBella, of De Studio DiBella, and Jennifer McKay of TD Bank. You know, we are bringing so much expertise. Your chat, everyone has been so engaged um, in the conversation and active and participating, which is wonderful. This has been an incredible, um, incredible time. And I just saw another question. I just wanna make sure that we ask it. So what would the lowest score be so a I saw that pop up. Yeah, it's no, we're not talking when we're talking about the credit scoring for the smaller size loans that we're not talking about your personal credit report. So we're we're still saying there is not a defined score on that. Um, check with your local bank what what their requirement might be, um, but that the credit score is a different type of credit score and it's one that your business is actually scored on. So it's something that you, you it's not on your personal credit. It's a totally different um, factor, you know, scoring method. And I don't know what the answer is on that minimum score, Eli. Again, only because I don't do that size loan typically. But um, it, I don't know if you want to comment on that at all further. Yeah, so, so on the personal side, you're absolutely right. Uh, we don't have a minimum score on the personal side, but the business combined with the principal has to have, you know, uh, average uh, credit at a minimum uh, for, for our system to produce an acceptable, you know, score. But again, uh, Jen, you know that we've got so many different programs, you know, our express program doesn't really require, you know, a score per se, we allow lenders to follow their own policies and procedures and, and for folks on, on, on this, you know, um, uh, event today, uh, there is so many uh, programs, SBA is not the only game in town, right, but our programs are so much more attractive for the reasons that Jennifer mentioned, you know, during this fiscal year or what's left of this fiscal year, you know, those fee waivers, you know, those increased guarantees are one more reason for lenders to say yes to your loan request. What DSBA does, we provide a guarantee. However, the money comes from a bank, a credit union, right, a, particip a participating SBA lender. So, but those increased guarantees, you know, those fee waivers in place help both you and that participating lender. So very helpful. So thank you all again for your time, for your participation and for just being here for this great event. So now it's my turn to turn this over to Stephanie Silva from the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Phenomenal uh, panel again, uh, just to reiterate your uh, your feedback, that was just uh, really great information and important information from all of you. And I'm glad we got those questions in because, you know, those those are questions that are important sometimes to people who are kind of nervous to ask. So really great engagement there. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Brie and Deborah. So we have um, just you know, our last sort of 20 minutes here. So we're gonna go straight in to our last uh, breakout room session. Stay on, go in those breakout rooms and we'll see you when we come back all together at 12 o'clock for closing. Yeah, nice, nice uh, attending and um, great, great speakers on that last session too. I like them. Thank great, you. you know, great advice, really is. Thanks, yeah. All right, everybody's back. I'm going to mute.
Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. I just want to thank all of our panelists. Um, thank you to Michelle, Deborah for moderating the panels. Uh, thank you all for your participation today. And just a really big thank you on behalf of the chamber. We want to thank uh, the SBA for, for their support and for today. Um, Eli and Bob for being here for all of the resources and information that you've been sharing and just your, your ongoing partnership and support of, of businesses throughout the city uh, is, is just something that we are very thankful for. So thank you so much. Um, we are going to stay on for a little extra after, like I said, if anybody wants to stay on. Um, but before we close, I'd like to turn it over to Bob for some closing remarks. Uh, sure. So again, uh, thank you to everyone who joined today for the businesses for uh, sharing their their stories uh, and their testimonials, uh, you know, uh, to the folks that moderated. Uh, absolutely amazing job. So uh, wonderful, uh, Michelle and, and Deborah, you know, really enjoyed listening to everyone and, and the conversation. It, it really is important. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, to... Uh, to piggyback off of something that Jennifer mentioned as far as her taking advantage of all these different things through a virtual environment and, you know, with the SBA, you know, and that's why I asked the question, because when we're doing events, we're finding that we're getting people from all across the country typically participating, even though we're marketing things for our businesses here in Massachusetts, but it's wonderful to learn from folks from all over the place. And I'll just share that the SBA, we have a couple real interesting events coming up. So there's a, a contracting matchmaker that our colleagues in New Hampshire are doing next week. Uh, you know, so connecting for contracts, if you're looking to uh, sell to uh, the government or large primes, you know, you might want to check out that opportunity. It's next week. It's virtual. Uh, uh, we're also doing what I think is a real uh, uh, amazing opportunity uh, coming up on May 26, which is going to be for innovative and high tech small businesses. And that, you know, we're doing that in collaboration with our Houston SBA office. And, you know, pre COVID, there's no way that the SBA Massachusetts office could do an event with a uh, and a district office in, in a totally different market, you know, halfway across the country. But uh, but during that event uh, on May, uh, May 26th, we're going to have Secretary Keneally. We're going to be talking about innovation and small business innovative research. And but, you know, trying to do something uh, to connect with that segment of the economy. And, but uh, the last thing I'll share before I close is uh, so, you know, um, I, I heard something recently that, uh, you know, if you think of everyone um, and everyone out there, you, you're either uh, uh, in a crisis, you've either uh, uh, going into a crisis or you're coming out of a crisis. And so hopefully for the businesses that are here, you're coming out of this pandemic, this, this, you know, horrible experience that we've all been through, but with everyone together, uh, you know, and these connections and the, the way that we've been able to, you know, inspire each other um, and the, the, amazing resources, you know, private and, and uh, public, uh, you know, to help small businesses to pivot to, you know, to, uh, to, again, to start new businesses to grow their businesses, you know, the, you know, I'm, in, I'm encouraged, I'm optimistic. And, and so again, uh, I, I wanted to start the meeting with, uh, you know, positivity, that's the way I'd like to close. And I, I often joke with people that I'm so positive, even my blood type is be positive. And that's the truth. So uh, again, I, I, I wish you all a wonderful weekend and success, but don't be shy about reaching out to anyone um, on the SBA team. We're here uh, for you. I, I, someone mentioned it, you're, you know, it's, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, it, it's, you can't be solo, you know, you're not alone in this journey. You have a, a, a wide array of resources to help connect you and to help you. So thank you all and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Thanks, Bob and Eli. Appreciate all your help on this. So great job with the technology and the breakout rooms. Uh, so again, uh, absolutely kudos, wonderful. So this was a fun event, a fun meeting. So uh, it's again, a good, good, one. good job. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off, uh, Eli. It's all yours, but uh, you know, have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Bob. So right. I don't know if, if if any questions. I see we still have a few people. You know, I don't know if anyone had any last remarks, any questions, anything. You know, uh, for the chamber, for us, for any of our.